Hello, everybody. Welcome to our session of Academic Reflections. Normally, we would be meeting you at this time of the year in the Long Gallery in Parliament Buildings for our annual event aimed at Teachers of Politics. However, given the pandemic, we've moved it on online and we hope to be offering you a series of talks over the coming months. So we're delighted to welcome today Dr. Claire Rice. Some of you may have heard from Claire last year and indeed um, follow her on social media. Claire works as a researcher in Newcastle University and is involved in a project to do with performing identities and looking at a post-Brexit Northern Ireland and uh, 21st century uh, governments. Anytime I talk to Claire, um, she, she tells me how much uh, she loves politics and we've certainly got quite a lot going on, not only locally, but all over the world. Um, plenty to keep Claire busy. So we're delighted uh, that Claire is going to give us um, a review, basically, of things that's been happening. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Marina McConville, who also works in the Education Service, just to talk us through the format. Hello, everyone, and I echo Anne-Marie's welcome. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank teachers who sent in some questions for Claire, and she will be touching on some of those issues that you raised, and hopefully we might have time for a couple of questions at the end. So without further ado, I hand over to Dr. Claire Rice. Hello, um, thank you for having me here today. I'm just going to take a couple of seconds to uh, start a screen share here as I have a few slides. And hopefully that can all be seen OK on your side. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to be uh, talking today, giving a bit of a review on politics in Northern Ireland. I have the date of 2020 here, but um, since I was speaking to you around about this time last year as well, quite a lot has happened. So I'm going to have to dip a little bit back into late 2019 in order to set the context for everything that has happened so far anyway in 2020. Um, so what's changed? The 2019 general election is probably the big uh, area that I'm going to uh, address in my presentation here. Um, and then I'm going to look a little bit at the new decade, new approach deal that was reached in January of this year and, and everything that has happened with the coronavirus pandemic in recent months as well um, have all factored into how politics has progressed uh, in Northern Ireland in recent months. So I'll be speaking a little bit about some key issues in those areas also. So first of all, the UK general election in 2019. So um, it was a big election. It was a surprise to some that it came when it did. I think certainly many political commentators were of the view that it was unlikely that there would be a wintertime uh, general election for many reasons, not least the practicalities of having to go out canvassing uh, in those cold uh, winter evenings. Um, but Boris Johnson came into power. Um, it looked like we had a bit of momentum with the Brexit process and we saw ourselves then in December pre preparing for a general election. Um, for Northern Ireland, there was a, a particularly interesting set of circumstances that came to the fore um, for this election. Um, the election took place in the context of public frustrations uh, reaching a crescendo uh, with the absence of governance, uh, government in Northern Ireland since 2017. Um, it was also in the context of strikes by healthcare workers. Um, it came on the back of two previous elections uh, earlier in 2019, um, which had seen the rise of the so-called centre ground in Northern Ireland. And as well by that stage, um, the three years without the institutions being populated by elected representatives, um, and for the most part, the running of Northern Ireland falling into the hands of unelected civil servants, um, really placed uh, almost a perfect storm of uh, circumstances to come together for something to have to change in Northern Ireland, even in regard to a Westminster election. Uh, talks in Northern Ireland in order to try and get the parties back together um, had already been underway at that stage. Uh, Julian Smith had come into power as Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in the summer of 2019. Um, and while there were still between uh, the parties on a suitable landing zone for an agreement by the time the election was announced. It was a positive sign, at least, that the parties were engaging in those conversations. Uh, for the 2019 general election then to happen when it did, it was an important one, in both in terms of the timing then for what was happening within Northern Ireland, but also in terms of what was happening externally um, at the higher levels in terms of 
the uh, UK's exit from the European Union and more generally politics uh, in Westminster. So I could speak all day about the election itself, but it's suffice to say here that there were a number of very hotly contested seats in Northern Ireland. And the results saw that there were a number of changes in terms of Northern Ireland's representation in Westminster. Um, we saw two DUP stalwarts, um, Nigel Dodds in North Belfast and Emma Little Pengelly in South Belfast, lose their seats uh, to John Finucane and uh, Claire Hanna, respectively. Um, we saw Sinn Féin lose their freshly gained seat in the Foyle constituency to the SDLP leader Colm Eastwood. Um, but we also saw the party gain in North Belfast from the DUP. Um, the SDLP, having lost all its seats in the previous election, then gained two seats in 2019 in South Belfast and in Foyle. And then, of course, we have the Alliance Party, um, who narrowly defeated uh, DUP, their DUP rival Alex Easton in North Down to replace the independent MP Lady Sylvia Herman. Um, and the alliance result here is particularly interesting as it came on the back of um, what I discussed last year um, in terms of what came to be known as the alliance surge and that, that so-called rise of the centre ground politics in Northern Ireland. Uh, meanwhile, we had Boris Johnson um, over in Westminster, who had secured a, a fairly comfortable majority in the House of Commons with the Conservative Party's results. And all of that meant that there was no need really to place any remaining reliance on support from the DUP from Northern Ireland, um, who up until that point had entered a confidence and supply arrangement with the Conservative Party under the leadership of Theresa May. Um, not only had the DUP lost this position of power in Westminster uh, as a result of the 2019 election, albeit there were uh, um, rumblings, uh, let's say, before that, um, but the results in Northern Ireland meant that there would be counter perspectives on the Northern Ireland position with regard to Brexit and a whole host of other issues um, on the floor of the House of Commons in a way that hadn't been seen there previously. So there was, a, a, in many ways, a changed dynamic uh, within the House of Commons. Um, at a more local level, that change dynamic um, also uh, came to the fore and very much helped the talks process in Northern Ireland. Um, while Julian Smith had the confidence of the parties, I think it's fair to say in Northern Ireland in terms of his brokership of those those talks, um, which was no main feat, it has to be said. Um, the fact that he was a Conservative Party MP and that the DUP was in an arrangement, uh, the confidence and supply arrangement with the Conservative Party, for much of the time that the uh, Northern Ireland Assembly wasn't functioning, meant in effect that it was very difficult to see any person that occupied the position of a Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and indeed the UK government uh, as anything by way of an honest broker in those talks. So the removal of that hurdle without the confidence and supply arrangement between the DUP and the Conservative Party, um, the position that Julian Smith found himself in, in terms of having the confidence of the political parties in Northern Ireland, and the wider the wider social context in terms of political and uh, of uh, public anxieties, um, public um, upheaval, and a general sense of frustration at the fact that local representatives weren't populating the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive, all created um, what effectively ended up being a rather perfect set of conditions for a deal to eventually be reached. So eventually, that deal was reached, um, and it came to the fore in the form of the New Decade New Approach Agreement, um, which was published on the 9th of January. Um, this document laid out the foundations for a return to the institutions and set out effectively what was a roadmap for steps that would be taken to address some of the deeper divisions uh, between the parties. Again, this deal is worthy of a talk all on its own. So I'll just highlight some of the key aspects of this deal here um, and perhaps pick up um, on some further issues relating to it then in questions afterwards. Um, Brexit, you would have expected, given everything that I've said so far, that it would have been a fairly central aspect to what the parties were discussing in the lead up to the signing of the agreement. And indeed, that a lot of the agreement itself would be geared towards managing Brexit going forward, um, taking account of the fact that at the time it was the biggest item on the agenda that the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive would have to deal with. Um, as it was, it was barely mentioned in the document um, in the 62 pages uh, that the document contained, it was mentioned a total of 16 times, um, which is extremely surprising given just how prominent it was as an issue between uh, between the positions of the parties and uh, in terms of the wider political climate. Um, soon after that, then, we uh, entered into the, the realm of uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and that's something I'll come on to a little bit later. But 
it is really surprising. Um, certainly at the time it was, and indeed now even looking back, the Brexit wasn't a more prominent feature in the new decade, new approach agreement. Um, there were a number of steps that were taken to include it. For example, an executive subcommittee on Brexit was formed, but it was disbanded then in May in response to the the redistribution that was necessary um, for resources in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and there were several other steps, but they have remained fairly um, under the surface. And indeed, the, the conversation around Brexit has been relatively piecemeal in the Northern Ireland Assembly compared to what you might have expected it would otherwise have been, um, again, in response largely to um, what has happened over recent months with coronavirus. Um, the new decade near approach agreement also included a number of measures um, that fall broadly, I guess, into the category of institutional resilience. Um, so here we saw some changes with regard to the petition of concern, which had been um, a particular um, red line issue for particularly Sinn Féin and DUP going into the talks leading up to the conclusion of the agreement. Um, where it still needs uh, an, uh, the number of 30 signatures from members um, in order to um, be lodged. The difference now is that those signatures must come from members from at least two parties. And if through a number of processes, then it is deemed that the petition of concern is valid, then there will be a 14 day period um, of consideration. All of this aimed effectively at trying to ensure that the petition of concern isn't used or indeed abused, as some would claim um, in the way that it was uh, previously. Uh, there was also the creation of a party leaders forum. Um, effectively, what this uh, is intended to be is uh, an opportunity for all the party leaders to get together periodically um, to talk about uh, things that aren't necessarily to do um, with the, the their normal day to day roles, let's put it that way, within the assembly or within the executive, but to provide, a, a, I guess, a, a more relaxed forum in which they can discuss issues with each other and and hopefully find a way of thrashing out issues before they become political uh, political challenges and uh, I, I guess in a way to provide an informal way in which a lot of conversations can be had that would otherwise not really happen until um, things were already so big an issue that cracks were already beginning to form uh, in the functioning of the upper of the institutions. Um, the final point that I'll address under institutional resilience is in terms of the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland and their obligations. Now, one of the bigger challenges that we saw after the collapse of the institutions in 2017 was that there was an almost what seemed like immediate jump into uh, an election. Um, and then, as we saw, there were several other elections that were held in, in that three year window, which all in their own ways and in, in very different ways served to reinforce the divisions that existed between the parties. Uh, the way things stand now, uh, the Secretary of State has a window of 24 weeks before they uh, can lapse, uh, 24 weeks that can lapse before they are obliged to call uh, a general election, which effectively it provides a window uh, of time there for the, the political parties to be able to deal with the fallout, whatever might have uh, given rise to any uh, institutional challenges, to recoup their thoughts and then to try and come back together to see if they can find a landing, landing zone of some form of an agreement, then um, that would mean the institutions can continue to function. Um, in, additional, in addition to this, during this time, ministers would be obliged to keep operating within their assigned roles um, essentially a way of trying to make sure that governance doesn't just stop in the event of any institutional challenges in the future, but rather there will be some form of continuation and at least um, a, a reasonable amount of time for parties to be able to find agreements. That means there won't be any interruption to governance at all going forward. In terms of transparency, this was a clear reaction to the RHI report, the Renewable Heat Incentive uh, Scheme, um, which uh, was published at the back of uh, at the back at the start of 2020. Um, so it was with one eye to that uh, being published, um, and with the other to the RHI affair, which itself precipitated the resignation of the late Deputy First Minister, and indeed the collapse of the institutions back in 2017, which led to the inclusion of these steps in the new decade new approach agreement. Um, these measures were explicitly aimed at, and I quote, rebuilding the trust of citizens. And they include measures such as requirements for improved record keeping, um, protections for whistleblowers, and the strengthening of ministerial accountability for their special advisors, otherwise known as SPADs. In terms of rights, one of the deepest red line issues dividing the parties um, was the question of language rights, and particularly around the Irish language. NDNA goes some way to enhancing the provision for language rights um, and provision for supporting the Irish language in Ulster Scots. 
Um, but it stops short of a full act, which was um, what had initially been sought going into the talks. Um, this was a clear compromise position, um, but for such a deep seated issue, it's really a matter of when, not if this will come back to the fore again. So in that sense, I guess, can be said that NDNA doesn't quite go far, quite go as far as perhaps a deal could have done. Um, but in terms of uh, future proofing the institutions, I mean, but it is perhaps likely that the damage that would have been caused by a failure to reach an agreement when this was achieved um, would have been even greater. So um, especially in the context of knowing now the challenges that Northern Ireland's politicians were set to face within just a few short weeks of their return uh, back to uh, their offices on the Hill, it, it really, uh, I guess it makes sense that it, uh, some sort of compromise was made at that stage in order to just get the institutions functioning again. Um, but again, the question mark is there as to when um, indeed that those challenges will arise again. Um, a second point then in regard to rights um, and a key aspect of the NDNA agreement was the creation of an ad hoc committee for a Bill of Rights. Um, now this is something, a Bill of Rights is something that has been in uh, conversation on uh, around equality law and human rights in Northern Ireland since uh, since the Good Friday Agreement. Um, so this is the first concerted effort that has been taken um, within the institutions in Northern Ireland in quite some time to dedicate um, real effort and focus towards uh, trying to figure out um, if a Bill of Rights is needed, what a Bill of Rights might look like, what it should contain um, and so forth. Now, the only challenge with this committee, it's doing excellent work at the minute. It's receiving a lot of um, evidence from various different sources, different expert input um, from different countries, from right across the UK and certainly from um, expert bodies within Northern Ireland as well. But one clear question mark that remains over it is actually what its purpose is intended to be. There's a little bit of ambiguity that still exists there in terms of whether its purpose is just to consider these factors, whether it's to make really stringent recommendations that need to be acted upon, um, whether it's to somehow eventually try and steer some legislation through the Northern Ireland Assembly. It really isn't clear exactly what the end game is for this committee as of yet. Um, and indeed, with rights being such uh, a relatively contentious issue uh, in terms of the divisions between the political parties, in some senses, it is a little bit of an elephant in the room as to what will happen with that. Um, but certainly the work of that committee is something that will be worth keeping an eye on uh, going forward. Um, finally, um, and one uh, short point to make about funding, um, many of the new ideas contained within the NDNA agreement, particularly in terms of the language support, for example, are contingent on additional funding being secured. Um, now, some of that funding was secured, but we saw in the days and weeks after the agreement was reached uh, that Finance Minister Conor Murphy um, had attempted to secure additional monies from Westminster to support the NDNA arrangements. Um, this has somewhat fallen off the radar again in light of COVID-19 um, and the need for additional funds in relation to managing that um, which is something that has been very present, particularly in, in the last few days. Um, but the challenges that existed in terms of supporting NDNA back in January and February of 2020 still remain uh, by and large. Um, so that's something that may be an issue going forward if it is the case that um, a lot of the, well, a number of the commitments, any of the commitments for that fact uh, can't be addressed. Uh, then that in itself will potentially cause an issue going forward, as we've seen before with previous agreements that have been reached to underpin the functioning of governance in Northern Ireland. Issues that are unaddressed tend to linger there and tend to, in their own ways, uh, lead to um, further challenges in the future. So it'll be interesting to watch in uh, the months and a uh, couple of years ahead to see how all of that will pan out, because the commitments have been made. There's an expectation that those commitments will be seen through. Um, there is a financial aspect to a lot of those commitments, which means that additional support will be needed. But how that support will be achieved whenever there is the competing priority of coronavirus to have to deal with, indeed, on top of Brexit as well, and the challenges that that will present for Northern Ireland. Um, it's very difficult to see how that will all work itself out going forward. So, Moving on then to talk about Brexit, um, in many ways it seems to have fallen a little bit off the radar 
uh, as well in light of the coronavirus pandemic. But um, it has very much been ticking away in the background. And indeed, the clock has not stopped ticking itself. Um, Boris Johnson in recent days has said that uh, he has set a date of the 15th of October, um, by which time he would expect to see reasonable progress to have been made in terms of reaching an agreement with the European Union um, on the exit um, exit strategy effectively for the, the transition phase and for the future relationship. Um, we, at the time of recording here, are fast approaching that deadline. Um, deadline and there is some, uh, some reports that perhaps that date might be be able to be waived a little bit, but uh, everything is still up in the air with that. So we still don't know what what is going to happen um, in that regard. We saw the uh, introduction recently of the Internal Market Bill, um, and that in many ways in itself has shown the importance of the the diverse perspectives on Northern Ireland being represented on the floor of the House of Commons, um, referring back to what I was saying uh, with regard to the, the 2019 general election. But the Internal Market Bill, uh, by its very existence, has been a serious point of concern with regard to the implementation of the Withdrawal Agreements Protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Effectively, that uh, pertains to what the future um, arrangements in Northern Ireland will be um, at the end of the transition phase. Um, What's happening at the minute in terms of the talks between the UK and the EU uh, with regard to the protocol is effectively trying to figure out how the technical details and the, the practical aspects um, of the protocol will operate in practice. Um, and there are several areas where there's uh, serious, uh, serious differences in opinions in terms of how that should be done. Um, the Internal Market Bill, uh, be it a political strategy, be it a uh, uh, a serious uh, intended move um, in what has been described as almost a, a, a security net for the United Kingdom in the event that there isn't a deal. Um, regardless of what the intended purpose of it is, really the fact that it has been introduced at all has had a serious impact on how the UK is being viewed in terms of um, the talks between the EU and the UK in terms of international discussions around trade deals, for example. And if anything, it has served to place Northern Ireland back uh, in the spotlight and very much um, place the emphasis back on the the underpinning idea of the protocol as it has been all along, which is to protect and uphold the commitments made in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. So the talks continue on that front. Um, but for the Northern Ireland Assembly, this is just another layer of complexity and challenge and indeed another whole set of unknown uh, outcomes that the, the Assembly and Executive is having to contend with at the moment on top of uh, coronavirus and indeed still trying to find its feet after three years um, of institutional hiatus. So there is a lot going on for um, our politicians at the moment uh, and indeed perhaps uh, more unknown about what they will be contending with in the weeks and months ahead than we know for sure at this stage. Um, we can't talk about 2020 without going into a little bit of detail about the COVID-19 pandemic itself. And I've touched going through on how this has impact on, impacted on the NDNA commitments, um, how it's interacted with Brexit, um, Indeed, how it has led to resources um, having to be redirected in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, I didn't mention earlier with regard to Brexit, but um, a number of the, the dedicated units that were initially set up to deal with Brexit, uh, the staff that had been allocated to them. Um, we heard earlier in 2020 that they have had to be redirected to dealing with matters um, related to the coronavirus pandemic. So. There are serious challenges facing the Northern Ireland Assembly at the moment, not just in terms of their financials, but in terms of human resources and the, what the capacity is within the institutions to be able to deal with all of these uh, calamitous issues coming together at one time to form um, a perfect storm. In the midst of all of this, then, we have had um, a series of controversies. Uh, for example, we had uh, the, the funeral of Bobby Story, which was attended by the Deputy First Minister. Um, we've had members of the DUP um, who have come forward uh, and have been pictured in public not wearing masks and have been openly critical of the, uh, the COVID-19 guidelines that have been in place at times. Um, and we saw for several months as well that all of those various issues came together to result in the First and Deputy First Minister refusing to share a platform together um, when delivering press conferences in relation to COVID-19 guidance. Um, in recent days as well, we have seen that uh, 
there has been some there have been some tensions within the executive in terms of the sharing of documents around uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic um, and in terms of uh, particularly from the alliance and SDLP perspective um, documents not being shared with them until the 11th hour before um, big decisions have to be taken uh, in terms of lockdowns and increased restrictions in Northern Ireland. All of these in any ordinary context would be um, to a certain extent. I guess, normal to have some political controversy, but the fact that they're happening in the way that they are um, at the time that they are would create the perception that there there may be cracks starting to form um, within the executive um, and between the political parties once again. I think it's perhaps a little bit hasty to to jump to conclusions so that that will equate to um, the, the foundations of the, the NDNA agreement being weakened in any way. Um, I think it's fair to say at this stage there's probably little um, political uh, impetus there for uh, any any serious challenges to be coming forward or for um, any uh, political upheaval to be happening. Um, so in that sense, I don't think there's much to be worried about um, in the immediate term. But certainly if this is the the beginnings of, of how the parties are going to be interacting with each other and certainly within the executive, how um, how the five party coalition will effective, effectively end up operating as a two or three party coalition with a, um, a number of uh, external observers who, who occasionally dip in, then that's a serious point of concern because it will fundamentally start to undermine uh, the, the basis of the commitments made in the NDNA agreement. Um, it will only serve to reinforce the distinctions that exist with regard to Brexit, and it will serve to make challenges going forward uh, even more difficult uh, to contend with. So just to sum up then, um, 2020 has been a year like no other for politics in Northern Ireland. And I feel like I say that almost every year now, whenever uh, I think about what has happened in the 12 months previously here. Um, but it has been one of the most challenging um, in Northern Ireland's history, that's for sure, um, with a number of issues which on their own would be difficult to deal with. But by them all coming together creates um, a perfect storm where you would almost expect everything to fall to pieces. But I think what has been shown so far is that there is uh, an underlying um, willingness to make sure that things work in Northern Ireland. So there is that positive to take away from things. Yes, there are some unaddressed issues within the NDNA agreement um, that will need to be addressed at some point. Um, and so long as they stay on the agenda, that that's at least a positive to be taking taking away from things. But I think where we need to be um, particularly cautious is if these uh uh, unaddressed issues then continue to be unaddressed and indeed if we get into the next election without any movement being made on those um, or at least even uh, even being loosely talked about in any way then that's whenever we will start to see public pressure growing um, that's where we'll start to see pressure coming from smaller parties within the Northern Ireland Assembly and ultimately um, could create the conditions which could precipitate a future uh, maybe not necessarily destabilisation of the institutions, but certainly future difficulties there that will need to be addressed. Um, so what the aftermath of all this will be in the years, months, indeed even weeks or days ahead remains to be seen. Um, but one thing's for sure, and that's the politics in Northern Ireland will not be dull going forward. Thank you very much, Claire, for that you know, very comprehensive and, and really interesting, you know, analysis of uh, the last year and the the perfect storm that you say is maybe overhead. Um, just a few a few questions, if if we might. Um, why do you think that it took so long for the two parties to come to a deal, to come to the new decade, new approach deal? I think it was a culmination of different factors. Um, ultimately, it was, well, it started off bad enough as it, as it was um, with the RHI situation. And then we had um, what felt like election after election after election at all different levels in Northern Ireland. And by their very nature, elections serve to expose the differences that exist between particular parties. There's no point in parties trying to highlight their commonalities. They're not going to get the votes. So um, each election in their own different way really exposed the, the distinctions and the fault lines between the pl political parties. And 
indeed even on a on a practical level for the parties to be seen to be um, working together, if I can put it that way, in the lead up to elections, especially those that uh, uh, happened in uh, 2019, it would have completely been the antithesis of what what they were were trying to do. They were trying to to there was almost an element of moral grandstanding, if I can put it that way, which meant that there wasn't there wasn't any real reason for the conversations to be happening cross party, at least in a public in a public realm. Um, so that's one element in terms of the political dynamics that just made it very, very difficult for the parties to be seen publicly, at least to be working with each other. Um, I think as well, um, I'd mentioned the presentation about the, the role of the Secretary of State, and that was such a key factor in Northern Ireland uh, in that three year hiatus. Um, we bounced from Secretary of State to Secretary of State to Secretary of State. Um, we eventually ended up with Julian Smith um, and Somehow he he managed to do the seemingly impossible and actually win the confidence of the parties and indeed um, was viewed very favourably by the public here in Northern Ireland as well. Um, so I think that had a key factor um, in terms of, I guess, reassuring the the parties themselves that there, there was somebody there who not only understood the situation in Northern Ireland, but was willing to engage with it and had a, a genuine interest in trying to get things sorted, um, which... Um, without disrespect to anybody, I think um, it's something that couldn't really be said of the likes of Karen Bradley or James Brokenshire, for example. That same relationship just hadn't really had the opportunity to form. Um, and I think as well, on top of all of that, we also had Brexit and the diametrically opposed positions that existed um, within the, the political sphere in Northern Ireland on Brexit made it very, very difficult um, for the parties to be able to sell to their basis that they um, were were happy to uh, be entering back into government with people that had such such different views. Um, and again, the Brexit process rolled along so so quickly um, over that uh, that three year or so window, um, and that again presented its own tensions because we had um, as time ticked on, then we had the Remain parties that were engaging quite widely with um, their counterparts in the Republic of Ireland. They were travelling to Brussels. We had the DUP then who were voicing what was perceived to be the Northern Irish voice in the House of Commons. And, and that very much, um, if we look back through Hansard transcripts at the time, very much seemed to, to shape how the Northern Irish position was being viewed by others in the House of Commons. And that, again, was extremely challenging um, from the the position of the political parties in Northern Ireland because how you reconcile those differences um, and again at a time where Brexit was the item on the agenda if I can put it that way um, the biggest issue that they would have to face such simpler times now with hindsight um, but that, that again added a, another layer of, of challenges there um, and, and I guess fundamental to all of that again was the, the DUP's confidence and supply arrangement with the uh, Conservative Party um, it basically meant that the UK could not be viewed in any way as an honest broker going into the talks. Um, it meant from a unionist position, well, not it fundamentally, but there was also uh, a counter position from the unionist perspective, whereby the, the role of the, the Irish government in terms of um, their, uh, their individuals from the Irish government coming up and, and becoming involved uh, in the talks, it meant that Brexit added the dynamic there that well, we, we can't trust them because obviously they're going to want the position of trying to keep a border free um, uh, or keep the island of Ireland border free, um, which by derivation means that there's going to be a border east west somewhere to separate us from the United Kingdom. So Brexit dynamics played into to every aspect of that. Um, relationship as well. And it, it really, uh, as, as things seem to have become the norm now, there was just the, the culmination of, of so many different factors that effectively left it impossible in many ways for the parties to be able to, to come together. Um, just going off on a slight tangent, there was a very close, uh, uh, close call on an agreement in, uh, I think it was 2018, I think I'm right in saying, um, and the issue there was that the deal that had been reached, particularly around language provision, um, wasn't able to be sold to uh, the base, uh, to the unionist voter base, essentially. And, and that collapsed. Um, I remember distinctly a television interview with um, Naomi Long, who um, was absolutely furious at what had happened because all, all indications had been that uh, a deal was going to, to get over the line at that stage. And it didn't. Um, and that in itself set things back a little bit because the parties almost felt aggrieved that things had got so close. Their efforts had been almost wasted by the fact that it hadn't been 
uh, being able to get across the line. Um, so that was another hurdle that had to be got across in order to um, in order to get the parties back together, in order to build that trust that there was a, an, an interest across the board and actually getting a deal agreed, finding a common landing zone that could be sold not just to the parties, but to the wider public as well. Um, but I think, to be honest, the way public frustrations were going by the end, uh, by mid to late 2019, um, any deal needed to be done. Um, it, it was it had almost got to a stage where it didn't matter about the red line issues, where it didn't matter about what the party's positions on Brexit were. The fact of the matter was people wanted their representatives back sitting in the assembly, back sitting in the executive and taking decisions Um rather than unelected representatives in the in the civil service, for example, having to take the lead on matters um, who indeed themselves were restricted in what they were able to do. So things did really reach uh, a stalemate in Northern Ireland. Um, so a very long answer to a very short question, but there was a, a, a lot a lot of different dynamics there that, that just ended up having the effect of protracting and, and elongating um, what was already going to be a very difficult time, but that just ended up making it a whole lot worse. OK, thank you, Claire. And you mentioned the, the planned 2022 election and you've referred to all the uh, elections that we've had in, in recent times. Um, and really, there's a lot to be done before then in relation to fulfilling commitments under new decade, new approach. Are you optimistic? Um, is the question that, you know, things will go ahead as normal then and... Uh, or do you see that that could be a movable feast? Um, it's a tricky question. I know it's something that Julian Smith has gone on record as saying that he would be in favour of um, in terms of delaying the election. I mean, um, but at this stage, I'm not convinced there would be any um, incentive for the parties to seek to extend it as much as anything. I don't think there's the bandwidth um, present at the moment to contemplate such such serious issues, which essentially boil down into matters of uh, fundamental constitutional type arrangements for Northern Ireland. So um, at this stage, I can't see it being an issue. I think things will go ahead as planned. But this is <laughs> at, at this stage, anything is possible. Um, and I guess probably coming up towards the election, if, it, if it's felt that the um, the representatives in Northern Ireland maybe haven't had an opportunity to be able to actually govern. We have to remember that NDNA came along approximately halfway through a mandate. So they've got about half a mandate to do um, a, a hell of a lot of work. And that's before you take account of everything else that has been added in on top of that. Um, I guess really at, at this stage, no, I don't see it being an issue. I don't see there being any delay there, but uh, who knows? Who knows anymore? <laughs> OK, do we have time for another another question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we do. OK, yeah. um, well, we have a question uh, here regarding official opposition. And of course, we don't have an official opposition at the moment. So I'm just wondering, Claire, if you think that helps the current very difficult situation in which the institutions are working or is it a hindrance that there's no official opposition? It's a very interesting question, especially um, in in relation to how the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic is being managed with regard to lockdowns and arrangements for that. Um, there has been some conversation, I guess, in recent days around the idea of, well, if there was an opposition there, you know, if, if Alliance for Toxic and uh, the SDLP had gone into a, an official opposition capacity, would they have been able to suggest um, alternative arrangements for how things could be managed, um, especially in light of the the well, what is rumoured at least to be the the uh, lack of papers being shared um, in advance of um, important executive meetings in recent times. Um, I think there's always, from a from a purely democratic position or, or perspective, sorry, there, there's always value in having an official opposition. That idea of having an alternative option on the table where you can almost have a benchmark to see. Uh, well, is is the, the government or are those parties that are in the position of leadership actually doing everything that they could be doing? Are they taking the best measures possible? You know, having that benchmark or that point of contrast, there is always value in that. Um, the difficulty with Northern Ireland is <laughs> we have a five party coalition at the minute and there's a, a very good reason for that. And the reason is in part 
the construction of the institutions and the way in which the consociational um, arrangements are designed in Northern Ireland, the way in which um, uh, seats are allocated, the way in which the executive functions. But that in itself is a reflection on challenges in, in wider society and through history in Northern Ireland. So there we're almost at that that stage where there's there's a bit of a tipping point in that we can either continue with the the multi-party coalition type model that we've had since 98 or we can start looking more to an opposition and we saw previously that there was an opposition and it it worked relatively well albeit it didn't really have much time to actually bed in and and get used to how that might might operate i think absolutely there would be value in that again going forward as much as anything to develop it as a concept within power sharing arrangements such as we have in northern ireland um and i think the idea of a normalization of of politics if i can put it that way um is no bad thing in northern ireland it's it's no longer a place that is dominated by to specific groups, you know, there there are other people, and um, there are other groups in Northern Ireland now that that don't identify with, you know, the ideas of unionism or nationalism per se, um, and our politics needs to develop and and grow to reflect that in a much better way. I think, um, whether or not opposition in the way that it's it's designed currently is the way to do that or not, I I I'm not sure because we haven't really seen it work in practice. What in my view anyway um, but certainly anything that can um, show that there is an alternative to what is being done is 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 valuable um, and th- at the minute the way that alternatives are being shown um, it's it's being done by parties that are already sitting within the executive so they're, they're fairly null points coming forward because it's either being perceived as a political strategy um, to try and exert some sort of uh, different arrangements within the executive that these public assertions are being made or it's being seen as as something that is is undermining the very operations of the institutions which itself has its own negative consequences um so it yeah it it, it would be great to see northern ireland move in in that direction but um i think at this stage with things as they are currently it might be perhaps too much upheaval and indeed with the amount of issues and the seriousness of the issues at the moment, there's a political capital to be gained from as many parties as possible having their fingers in the pie to be able to claim some uh, political uh, yeah, politi- political brownie points, if I can put it that way, from being involved in any anything positive that comes from what's being done at the moment. So. Okay, thank you very much, Claire, for that. Thank you, Marina. Um, a few questions here that got submitted uh, to myself. It's not often a bill makes a headline, but this one did. And a teacher has asked, what are your thoughts on the executive functions bill? Mm, um, a very wide ranging question has to be said. Um, I guess there's a number of different ways in which you can think about the executive functions bill. Um, from the perspective of Northern Ireland pre-NDNA, um, it was in many ways, I guess, a necessary evil. It was it was there as a way of ensuring that governance didn't entirely lapse in Northern Ireland, if I can put it that way. Um, it did try to an extent to plug some of the gaps that were there, but it was extremely controversial in some of the um, the steps that it enabled to be taken. Um, it in many ways showed the the challenges of devolution. It showed that Northern Ireland, um, as, well, as much as Scotland and Wales in, in their own regard, but for, for Northern Ireland specifically, it showed that the nature of devolution isn't something that is entirely fixed. It showed um, and really emphasised that uh, temporary nature of arrangements and showed that that things can change in that regard in terms of that relationship between Westminster and the devolved institutions in Northern Ireland. Um, and in that sort of more theoretical level, it was an extremely interesting bill insofar as um, it made it uh, very blatantly obvious what, what those challenges could be and indeed what they were in practical terms. Um, for Northern Ireland more generally, I, th- I think it showed that um, if devolution or if the institutions, sorry, do cease to operate again, that if there are overhanging issues pertaining to um, matters that are fall, on, fall under the category of, of human rights, for example, that it isn't necessarily 
all was down to the Northern Ireland Assembly just to deal with that. There is that that wriggle room again, feeding back to that um, what I mentioned about the nature of devolution for Westminster to step in. Um, yes, it, it raises its own constitutional questions as to when that can happen, how that could happen, um, if indeed it, it should happen at all. Um, but I think it showed that um, even in the future, it's it's almost set a precedent that Westminster can use in the future for stepping in to take decisions that are perhaps uh, more more difficult to be ta- taken in the Northern Ireland Assembly. I think in some ways, as controversial as some of the elements of that bill were, of, of that act were, um, it, it removed a number of really deep-seated issues from the agenda that for the parties to have to deal with in Northern Ireland. And in that sense, it made it um, a little bit easier, perhaps you could say, to reach agreement because there were there were matters that were almost taken out of the hands of the parties in Northern Ireland. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it kind of, of helped things. But of course, then it, it raises its own questions around um, the 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 rightness or the wrongness, uh, if I can put it that way, of of uh, using that type of mechanism in order to do it. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I've, I've really answered that question as well as uh, I possibly could have, but um, I guess the long and short of it is that it it really um, exposes the, the the challenges of of the devolution relationship um, and has set a precedent, I guess, for how things can be done differently potentially in terms of that Westminster Northern Ireland um, relationship going forward in the event that there is a further collapse of the institutions for such a sustained period of time. Okay, thank you, Claire. And you ended your presentation by making the comment that you could guarantee that political life wouldn't be dull. So uh, with that comment in mind, a teacher here has asked, Uh, what do you think the next crisis will be and what will it look like? Oh, dear. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I guess I guess it's the thing with Northern Ireland politics in that you almost expect every time a deal has been reached that it in itself will precipitate future challenges, either through partial implementation of some of the commitments, non-implementation of them, um, wrong implementation of them or things just being uh, completely ignored. And I think I think as much as anything, we have to almost expect the same will come from the NDNA agreement. Um, as as we've highlighted already, there there are so many challenges at play. It's inevitable that not everything will be um, brought into fruition in Northern Ireland. And I think, um, while while I don't want to be pessimistic, I think it's almost an expectation in Northern Ireland that there will be um, a future challenge or a future issue going forward. Um, and there are so many things on the plate at the moment, it's it's hard to see how one of those won't precipitate something. But I think what's important to highlight at the minute is that there is no political ambition for things to be destabilised. There's no political ambition um, or incentive, if I can put it that way, for um, for politics in Northern Ireland to, or for, for the institution, sorry, in Northern Ireland to be shaken in any way that will ultimately destabilise them. Um, so I think we're in a, a, a relatively safe zone at the minute where there will be a lot of politicking. There will be a lot of um, a lot of squabbles between the parties. I think there's plenty um, between coronavirus and Brexit um, in and of themselves that will, will leave the parties publicly anyway being uh, quite vocal in arguing against each other and putting forward different perspectives. But I don't believe that there is a will there to undermine the institutions or to upend everything. So probably, yes, there will be challenges further down the line. Um, Do I see those happening in the immediate time? I don't. So in that sense, we need to take the positives where we can find them. I think we're safe enough in that regard. Um, But yeah, it's 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 a fair comment that you almost expect the next the next issue uh, to be coming down the road in Northern Irish politics. It's it's still fragile it's in, in terms of trying to find its fate. It's still trying to grapple with so, so much um, things as a society in general in Northern Ireland were changing and the politics and the political arrangements here, uh, they, they've always struggled, that model in particular struggles with reflecting those type of changes. And I think going forward, that's where we'll see the real challenges starting to come through um, for politics in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you, Claire. Marina, any other questions at your side that 
No, and I, I definitely won't ask one about the American election. We'll be here for another hour. <laughs> exactly. Well, maybe, Claire, um, I'll end with uh, something that you touched on last year. Uh, given that our audience here um, is, is on the academic side with teachers and students, is there anything uh, as an academic yourself that you would signpost teachers and students to look at, to examine uh, any thoughts, given that wasn't that long yourself that you were doing your A-levels in politics? <laughs> oh, I feel older <laughs> by the day, so it's probably a lot longer than I, I would like to, to think about. But um, yeah, I guess probably from, from my perspective, um, it was something I touched on in the presentation, the work that is being completed by the Ad Hoc Committee on a Bill of Rights is particularly interesting. Um, as I said, there, there's some ambiguity around what what the end point is that that committee is is looking to to work work towards. But the work that it's doing is very interesting, and some of the conversations they're having is really shining a light on what are really fundamental questions around how society functions and operates, and and what a future society, um, rights based society in Northern Ireland needs to look like, and what that needs to be inclusive of. Um, so I think that's something that's that's really interesting to to keep an eye on at the moment and to follow. Um, and I think as well, we're coming into the centenary year for Northern Ireland. So there will be a lot of work being done on that. Um, again, it's it's there's a political dynamic to that. It's going to have its own challenges going forward. But um, I think looking at a lot of the work that will be coming out in response to that over over the next, uh, what are we in October? So next year or so um, will be really, really interesting. And again, that will speak to a lot of the politics, a lot of the, the thoughts around not only what Northern Ireland as a place is now, if I can put it in those terms, but um, what it might look like in the future, constitutionally, socially, um, economically, for example. Um, and very much all of those conversations will will slide quite nicely into considerations um, aligning with Brexit and coronavirus and uh, all of our contemporary politics here as well. So those those would be two things in particular that I would keep an eye on going forward. OK, thank you very much. Um, Claire, it's been very insightful and analytical as ever. Um, on behalf of the Education Service, we would like to say uh, a huge thanks to you, uh, especially for being so flexible and working with us in, in the new arrangements. So um, we'll put put this post up and put it up on our on our website and signpost it to teachers and um we look forward to an eventful time in Northern Ireland politics and beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks. much, Claire. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome.